one that I'm particularly fascinated by, and actually I think we would almost have to say that this would be a first-generation neuroplastician, would be Feldenkrais. Can you talk a little bit about Feldenkrais and his work? Okay. Well, there were two thinkers that I included in this book who you might say they are old hat. But I actually think that these are people who did absolutely remarkable things in the age before brain plasticity was accepted and therefore were not understood. Some people have heard of the Feldenkrais technique, which is a movement-based technique, and they think that what it is is it's something for sore necks and aching backs. But Feldenkrais actually worked with a number of severely brain-damaged people. And I talk about his work in detail with a woman who had a stroke and a reading problem and another, a girl who was born with cerebellar hypoplasia, which in her case basically de facto meant that she was missing a third of her cerebellum. It just was not functioning. It wasn't there to function. And I'll get back to that in a second. Just say a few words about Feldenkrais. Feldenkrais was a very serious nuclear physicist. He worked in the Joliet Curie lab that had major, major breakthroughs in discovering artificial reactivity. And Einstein wrote about them. And he actually was involved in smuggling certain secrets out of France as the Gestapo was approaching their lab in the hope of getting at the atomic secrets. And he went to England. He was clearly a genius who had mastered many domains and many intellectual disciplines. He was also one of the first people to bring judo to Europe. And he had terrible soccer injury. In fact, while he was trying to escape the Gestapo with these secrets, his knee was acting up terribly. And then he worked for counterintelligence for the British on submarines to protect British submarines, and he often slipped and hurt his knee. And so he began to apply everything he knew from physics to understanding how his knee would work, but he'd also learned a lot of things, and this is where the Eastern tie comes in, about movement and awareness from his judo master, Kano. Then he would lie in bed for many, many hours and just move his knee very, very gently to understand how it worked. He also read a lot of neuroscience, and Feldenkrais basically came to the conclusion very early on that the brain was plastic, that it was programmed by our activities, that mind and brain and body were one, that there is no such thing as simple abstract thinking separate from motor activation, that they're related all the time, so that even when you're thinking a thought or thinking of saying something but you don't say it, if you had your hand on the voice box, you could detect little movements and so on, and that thought always had a motor component. You're lying in bed and you're thinking something that's emotionally upsetting, but you don't get up and do something. But there, you know, there's tension or high tonus there, for instance. One of his most important insights, again, somewhat coming from the East, is that most of the movements we do, we do without close awareness. And if you apply awareness to movement, you can change the movement and the structure of the circuit. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the way to get awareness of movement is to slow it down and make it very gentle and light. Only then can you observe the effects of the movement. As he would put it, if he had an iron bar and a fly lands on the iron bar, you can't detect it. If it lands on a feather, you can detect it. I think that was one of his examples. Very small movements are much easier for the brain to register and learn and differentiate. Now, Many people would come to him, for instance, with problems in spasticity. He'd see people with cerebral palsy and so on and so forth. A lot of kids who have developmental problems with special needs, for instance, do something called toe walking because their calves are so tight or their adductors are very tight so they can't separate their knees. And the way that this would be treated would be with surgery to sort of cut the muscles to extend them or Botox repeatedly. Some of these kids were born with eye problems and they would cut and rearrange the eye muscles. And what he found is in all of these kids, there was very high tonus. And because he believed holistically it was a mind-brain-body problem, instead of trying to correct the high tonus by cutting the muscles, or as some people would do, just stretching them all the time, which causes these children an immense amount of pain, he realized that it's a brain problem. The brain is creating all of this high tonus, and it's very poorly regulated. And he would find that by very, very gentle movements, 
he could get the brain to use awareness to lower the tonus. Now, the best way I can describe this to you is an experiment that he actually did on himself. It's often done in Feldenkrais awareness through movement lessons. Let's say you have a tight neck, neck tension. He would lie down to eliminate the role of gravity on the body, and then he would might tuck his head the smallest amount he possibly could. I'm talking about a quarter of an inch with total awareness and up and down. And he might concentrate his awareness just on the left side of the body as he did this. And he might do this for five, six, seven minutes, many, many repetitions, just concentrating. And just through the awareness, over the time, he would find that his entire left side of his body would release and work with ease. Now, it's very, very interesting. This is not simply putting yourself into a parasympathetic state of relaxation because the right side wouldn't release because you weren't casting the light of awareness on the right side. To use a more sort of neuroscientific language, he was basically saying, you know, we have these sensory motor loops and they work together. And we've been thinking them as though they're radically separate. So this is more holistic. And in fact, most people do not know this, but there actually are some sensory cells in the motor cortex. I learned this from Carl Pribrat, who's a neurosurgeon. But you don't even need them to be physically situated there to understand that the circuit works holistically. And the sensory part of the circuit is designed always to help us know, you know how the movement is going. And by using mental awareness, you can speed up this process. Now, later on, you might spend half an hour in a Feldenkrais class just doing an awareness of the left side of the body, and then five minutes at most doing awareness on the right side of the body, and it'll release much faster because the right side is learning from the left side. Feldenkrais would say, the right side is not learning from me. It's learning from your left side. The trick here would be to do random movements very, very gently to see what felt best. So the body learns I love massage, but it's very different from going to massage and kneading the body or pressing acupressure spots, and it's very, very different from physiotherapy. It's an awareness-based approach. Now, if you've got the person in a quiescent state, you could use this technique on kids with severe brain damage to, for instance, release high tonus. When the tonus goes down, they can be much more aware. He was very big that the way the brain is learning is through something called differentiation. And in fact, in that example I gave you, you are learning to differentiate what a good move feels like, an uncomfortable move, and so on. In the book, I have examples of children who were born with brain damage of various kinds being helped. So that girl, Elizabeth, I described, she was practically paralyzed, had very, very few movements, was thought to be intellectually, utterly incompetent, and... He worked with her on these various differentiations, and he also had a whole theory of development that I can't get into right now, but instead of trying to get her to do the things that everyone else wanted her to do, he got her to do the things that were appropriate for development. Make a long story short, she did advance. At one point, when the parents were completely distressed with this child who was practically immobile, he said, she will dance at her wedding. And over the years, he worked with her She did work with a couple of other therapists, most notably Anant Baniel, and I believe a woman named Ruthie Alon had some work with her as well. And she did dance at her wedding, and she got two graduate degrees. And she spends her time reading Tolstoy and Shakespeare and so on and so forth. So this would be a movement-based intervention combined with thought and awareness that was helpful.